Good morning. I want to begin by thanking the Decorative Arts Trust for inviting me to take part in this colloquium and for supporting my research. What a privilege it is to be here today in this setting and with so many talented colleagues. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation for graciously hosting me over the course of several days last spring. My presentation today, Reinterpreting an American Chair, Clara Porset and Joseph Albers' Butaque, is based on research conducted during my time at the Foundation. Before I dive into Porset and Albers, I want to provide an overview of what is a butaque and why is it important. Designed for optimal comfort and repose, a butaque sits low to the ground and consists of both an inclined seat and back attached to a wooden frame to form a characteristic J-shaped chair as seen here in this image. A butaque can be referred to by many names depending on the region it was made. Um, most popularly known as a butaca or a silla campeche, a name given uh, because the chair was produced and exported from the Mexican state of Campeche to the port of New Orleans. It was eventually anglicized uh, to be Campeche chair. For the purposes of this presentation, I will mostly use the word butaque, which is the term used in Mexico and by our protagonists, Porcet and Albers. My interest in this furniture type stems from my dissertation titled Mapping an American Chair Form, The History and Evolution of the Butaca, which surveys the impact multiple cultures had in the development of this chair type within a larger historical <coughs> and territorial framework. And by American, I am referring to the American continent, uh, what we understand today as the modern Americas after the European conquest. My goal is to show how successive makers adapted the Butaque's features in innovative ways and with an ever-evolving syncretic set of cultures that was a result of colonial encounter and intermixture in countries such as Mexico, Venezuela, Cuba, and the United States, among other regions. Research, okay. Research published by Jorge Rivas Perez prove the butaca derives from pre-Columbian ceremonial high back chairs that include the butaca and tuje found in Venezuela and the dujo used throughout the Caribbean. Rivas Perez referenced 16th and 17th century publications that included dictionaries uh, of terms used by the indigenous groups from Cumaná, a northern coastal area in Venezuela. The tuje was defined as a chair made of wood and putaca was another word used in Cumaná to refer to a similar kind of reclined seat. Butaca would eventually become Butaca. The indigenous people of Cumaná are ancestrally connected to their Arawak ethnic groups that inhabited the Caribbean islands and are now referred to as the Taíno and Lucayan cultures. Tujes and Butacas are related to, sorry, Tujes and Putacas are related to Taino and Lucayan duhos that were uh, revered ritual seats used by high-ranking members of society. Duhos are stylistically more elaborate than Venezuelan tujes and putacas. These chairs are carved from a single piece of wood and include anthropomorphic and zoomorphic details, as well as incised decorative patterns as seen here in these two incredible examples from Hispaniola. Caciques used duels for cojoba rituals that included consuming hallucinogens to stimulate um, communication with powerful deities for guidance concerning significant decisions. However, duels were also used in social and political events, such as the reception and feasting of neighboring dignitaries, allies, and kin that provided an occasion to underscore the high status of both guest and host. First-hand accounts published by the Dominican friar Bartolomé de las Casas not only described the use and significance of the dujo among the Taíno, but confirmed it was one of the first indigenous objects encountered by Europeans upon their arrival to the Caribbean. For centuries, the butaque was thought to have originated in Spain from the sillón de cadera, a chair form stemming from the ancient Roman curule chair. Both chairs have curved legs forming a wide X on the front and back. 
the cruel chair was a symbol of power used by government officials in ancient Rome, as seen as in these uh, Roman coins. Um, it had no back and could easily be folded um, and transported. A sillon de cadera notably includes a backrest and is not foldable. It was among the earliest chair types to arrive in the Americas with European conquistadores um, and was associated with high social status and influence. The X form of the legs became evidence for the butaque to be linked to these two European chair types, no one taking into account that what made the butaque distinctive was its reclined sloped back um, and not its X-shaped legs. The argument that furniture makers in the colonial Americas based the butaque solely on the sillon de cadera ignores indigenous seating types that were also present at this time. While objects like the duo exemplify indigenous people's mastery of wood carving techniques, joinery was not used in the pre-Columbian artisan's practice, which was subsequently introduced by Europeans along with nails, iron tools, and serrated saws. Drawing from both native and European seating traditions, the butaque emerged as a new type of chair used in intimate private spaces and for rest and respite from the heat. Um, and this here is very essentialist. Um, if my dissertation advisor saw this, he would scream. But um, it's just a way for, for you all to get an idea of the different types of chair, how, how these two chair forms come together um, and influence the, the butaca. And um, just a quick image of one of the earliest existing butacas, uh, which is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The 19th century uh, butacas had entered, uh, sorry, by the 19th century, butacas had entered the US market and had spread along the East Coast. Thomas Jefferson famously waited nearly 10 years to get his hands on a butake. He called it a Campeche hammock, which for irony, I would just like to add that the word hammock is derived from the Taino word hamaca. Um, Jefferson eventually procured a butake made in New Orleans. On the left is a contemporary rendering of the original, now lost, uh, which has an unmistakable Federalist quality. It was known to be his favorite chair and even um, he had enslaved carpenter John Hemings make examples for Monticello, which is pictured in the center. Upon Jefferson's death, his possessions were sold to pay off his debts, as seen here in an unsettling document listing a bill of sale that includes a young enslaved boy, Marshall, and a Campeche chair. In the 19th century, uh, the butake also became a chair that was no longer used solely in the private spaces of a home, but was also used outdoors. Here are two examples, um, one in Virginia and another uh, that shows a butake made in either Mexico or New Orleans at the New Jersey home of James Colas. Now we're transitioning to the main event. Um, I want to begin by introducing Claro Porcet a pioneering Cuban-born designer who settled in Mexico City as a political exile in 1935 at the age of 41 and would become one of the leading designers in the country. Percet, Percet's most emblematic furniture design was her modern reinterpretation of the butaque, pictured here in this living room um, in the Casa Ortega. Her numerous butaques were distinguished by a minimalist aesthetic as well as an acute attention to materials and craftsmanship. It is through her various iterations of this chair that I've come to understand Porcet's impact on mid 20th century modernism and her position within an influential network of artists, architects, designers, and intellectuals. You can see here um, images of the architect Luis Baragan's house with numerous butaques designed by her. Before settling in Mexico, Porcet established herself as a prominent furniture and interior designer in her native Cuba, receiving commissions for private homes, schools, hospitals, and clubs. In 1931, she presented a paper advocating for the use of the term interior design um, as an alternative to interior decoration, which she believed gave the impression of a dormant rather than refined functionalism. Porcet also introduced the concept of using fib natural fibers and resources native to the region 
to produce furnishings appropriate for the Caribbean that would stay cool in the hot climate. In 1933, she founded the Architects Institute of Cuba and became the director of the Technical School of Women. Although her wealthy upbringing afforded her an impressive education in the United States and Europe, she regretted never studying at the Bauhaus, and she wrote Walter Gropius to inquire about enrollment. But the rise of Germany's National, National Socialist Party and its increasing pressure on the school prohibited her from attending. Gropius recommended she contact the German-born artist and educator Joseph Albers, a Bauhaus professor, who had recently left the school with his wife, Annie, to begin teaching at the newly established experimental art school, Black Mountain College. In September 1934, Porcette traveled to Asheville, North Carolina, where she took courses with the Albers on the fundamentals of composition and design. Black Mountain was an important and influential experience for Porcette. Of her time at the school, she wrote, seeing is better than reading, so I went to Black Mountain College, a place lost in the mountains of North Carolina, beautiful if there is anything beautiful, where Albers now gives his wonderful teaching with the prodigality of one who is the owner of, a, of an inexhaustible treasure. Later that year, Porset invited Albers to give three lectures at the Lyceum Club in Cuba. Founded as a women's social club, the Lyceum flourished as a center of arts and culture where intellectuals and artists gave talks, conferences, and exhibited their work. Albers gave a series of three talks which were all delivered in German and translated to Spanish by Porset. You can imagine what that was about. It probably took a very long time. Here's a striking program designed for the event that included a bold image of Albers in profile. He was well received in Cuba and his lectures were written about favorably in the local press. Accompanied by Annie Albers as well as Theodore and Robert Dreyer, uh, the group drove from North Carolina to Miami and then arrived in Cuba by ferry. Albers, an avid photographer, took many pictures throughout their three week visit. This trip to Cuba marked the first of many trips to Latin America Joseph and Allie Albers took in the decades to come. In particular, the couple formed a deep connection to Mexico and over the course of their lives made 13 trips to the country. Once Porcet was settled there, she and her husband, the Mexican artist Javier Guerrero, uh, the two are pictured at the center, uh, became instrumental in connecting the Alberses to their creative circle of friends, which included the likes of Diego Rivera. While countless photographs of these trips exist, no correspondence between Joseph or Annie Albers and Porcet survive. Their relationship is mostly documented through photographic clues and sparse archival materials. It's important to note, uh, Porcet arrived in Mexico during a period marked by cultural and philosophical idealism. Uh, she immediately became involved with the Liga de Escritores y Artistas Revolucionarios, or LEAR, a collective of socialist thinkers, artists, and writers, and writers and architects established in 1933. Through LEAR, she met her husband, Guerrero, who exposed her to Mexico's indigenous material culture and vast artistic traditions. However, in general, this was a time when artists were particularly interested in, in exploring indigenous identity and visual culture as a means of developing uniquely, a unique uh, Mexican aesthetic. Here's a great image of uh, Porcet's living room uh, filled with butaques, books, and indigenous ceramics. There is no doubt Joseph Albers was deeply captivated by both ancient and contemporary, and contemporary Mexican indigenous culture. On the right is a page from, um, sorry, in the previous slide, uh, there was a, very quickly, uh, here's a page um, from one of his photo books uh, documenting a trip to Monte Alban in Oaxaca, uh, but there are hundreds of photos that capture his fascination with indigenous culture. While Albers' interpretation of the Votaque um, has often been directly linked to his friendship with Porcet, uh, a point I have also made, uh, Albers likely encountered the Votaque through multiple avenues, including Diego Rivera, who's a, a picture made by him, uh, during his trip 
um, sorry, including Diego Rivera, um, and also throughout his other trips um, in Mexico, there are a variety of regional butaque styles throughout Mexico. Here's an example by the Chinatec people and uh, a work by the Mexican artist Francisco Suniga depicting a huichatang woman seated on a butaca. Both are from the state of Oaxaca. Two sketches dated circa 1940 show Albers working through the chair's design that ultimately led to, a two, to two versions for Black Mountain College, now identified as Mexican chair type A. The first examples uh, were first produced by Edward Dupuy, a local woodworker who often uh, did work for Black Mountain College. Um, after he produced the wooden frame, the chair was sent to Asheville Harness Company uh, for leather upholstery. And so you can see the two here. Um, Mary Gregory, who became head of the woodworking shop at the school, then took over the production of the butacas and other furniture styles that were used on the campus. As you can see on the top left side, um, uh, the butake with the handle was smaller than the one without. And seen here uh, in Joseph and Annie Albers's, um, they had their own collection of butakes in their living room at the school, not quite as intense as Por ser en Guerrero's jam-packed butaca living room, but they were there. And while these chairs were ultimately constructed for the dormitories, um, it's not, it was not uncommon to see the butacas used in other parts of the campus, like the classroom. In fact, students would sometimes take them uh, when they left the school, and some examples survive today. It is believed that Albers himself traced the outline of one of Corset's chairs and took notes on its construction, although this evidence has been lost to time. While this may be true, I was struck to find um, this image on the left of a, of a butaque made in Tehuantepec, Oaxaca. It was actually included in an article published by Corset and juxtaposed with a photo of one of her own butaque designs which took um, a quite different uh, style and approach. However, when seen next to Albers's butaque, the similarities are, are really striking. You see them in its the style, the form, and construction. While Porset likely played an instrumental role in Albers's decision to design his own butaque, it would be a mistake to discount the influence indigenous made butaques had on him as well. The Alberses continued to furnish their living room with butacas and use their chairs um, made at Black Mountain until their passing. At their foundation, I was particularly drawn to two portraits of them taken on butacas. Joseph seen um, seated with his painting in the background and in Annie's portrait, you can see a section of one of her weavings at the top right of the corner. The chair, perhaps a symbol of their time at Black Mountain and their love for Mexico both experiences that shape their lives and creative practices deeply. Thank you.